Conspiracy theories can help people see the world from a different perspective and lead to questions that they hadn't thought of before. Even when these questions have simple answers and the theories shouldn't be taken seriously, it's always good to look at what we know and how we know it. Number 5. Since 1993, the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, or HARP, in Alaska, has been researching the Earth's upper atmosphere to try to get a better understanding of the boundary between Earth and the vacuum of space. For just as long, it's been the subject of conspiracy theories that continue to this day. HARP's official purpose is to investigate the ionosphere, an important part of the Earth's atmosphere when it comes to communications and electricity. Rather than being a simple layer depending on height, the ionosphere overlaps the three highest levels of the atmosphere and changes depending on the time of day. It's here where radiation from the sun ionizes particles. It helps form the boundary between the vacuum of space and the lower atmosphere. And it's here where most of Earth's satellites orbit. It's also the layer where radio and GPS signals travel through. Understanding how the ionosphere works and reacts to various phenomena, both Earth-based and from space, is an important goal for scientists. It's also important for militaries who rely on the ionosphere for navigation and communication like the rest of the population. In 1993, a new facility was opened to develop our understanding of this important layer. It was founded as a joint project between the Air Force, Navy, University of Alaska, and the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA. Even when there was military involvement, the main goal of this new facility, given the name HARP, was to study the ionosphere for scientific reasons. HARP worked by using high-frequency radio waves in the range of 3 to 30 megahertz. These are fired at the ionosphere and cause a small disruption in the layer. Scientists can then study the disruption. The project helps scientists understand what would happen when a solar flare or storm on the sun hits the Earth's atmosphere and could help us prevent damage to our electrical and communication systems. It could also help to improve navigation in the polar regions, as well as detect underground structures using radio waves. The disturbance only lasts for a brief period of time and hasn't caused any lasting changes in the atmosphere. Despite this, many conspiracy theorists believe that HARP is responsible for everything from natural disasters to mind control. As early as 1996, there was a book published suggesting that HARP was some kind of government secret weapon with the ability to cause natural disasters. On the surface, the idea that HARP could be affecting the weather is somewhat plausible, but the scientific evidence doesn't hold up. The conspiracy theory suggests that by ionizing these particles, the energy causes hurricanes, flooding, or other weather phenomena. It could also cause geophysical problems. The idea that solar flares could cause earthquakes is popular in disaster movies. As HARP tries to understand the layer of the atmosphere where solar flares would cause the most damage, there is a logic that it could lead to the same problems as solar flares themselves. Even if there were no nefarious motivations behind the HARP project, it's possible that it could cause significant damage. Or at least that's what the conspiracy theory would suggest. Of course, most believers of the conspiracy theory don't believe this impact would just be an unexpected side effect. Rather, this would be the main purpose of the device. HARP was used to deliberately cause weather disruptions and earthquakes for various reasons, according to the conspiracy theory. Some of these reasons involve punishing various populations. For example, an earthquake in Syria and Turkey at the start of 2023 was blamed on HARP. Conspiracy theorists alleged that the US and other NATO countries had warning beforehand and evacuated their embassies before the earthquake struck. Other reasons to control the weather concern finances. A conspiracy theory post shared on Instagram and Facebook alleges that HARP is used alongside chemtrails to manipulate the weather for a price. By paying thousands of dollars to so-called rain-free wedding companies, a couple could guarantee pleasant weather for their wedding. The scheme would involve jets leaving microscopic heavy metals in the atmosphere, which are then excited by radio waves sent from HARP. Of course, the science in this conspiracy theory doesn't make much sense when investigated deeper, and the theory has been debunked multiple times. The main problem with the theory is that weather doesn't happen in the ionosphere. Almost all weather happens in the troposphere or the stratosphere, 
these are the two lowest levels of the atmosphere and reach a maximum altitude of 50 kilometers. Hurricanes, for example, have an altitude that typically reaches a little over 15 kilometers. Clouds occupy the space beneath 6 kilometers. The ionosphere, even at its lowest point, only reaches 45 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Harp's disruptions of the atmosphere at this level don't have any impact on weather, because it simply doesn't happen there. Jets and other aircraft also fly much lower than the ionosphere. If the condensation trails behind aircraft did contain heavy metals, which is a conspiracy theory in itself, the radio waves from Harp wouldn't be interacting with them. Cloud seeing is a real thing. This typically involves dispersing salts in the atmosphere, which cloud condensation and ice particles can form around, resulting in precipitation. Studies are yet to show these techniques have any significant impact on the weather though, but it is a possibility that's being explored. But this has nothing to do with HARP. The possibility that HARP is causing earthquakes is even less plausible. So far, scientists have yet to find any evidence that solar flares and storms on the sun's surface have any geophysical impact on Earth. The disaster movie trope isn't grounded in science. There's no reason why causing disturbances in the ionosphere would cause earthquakes, and no evidence that anybody had any early warning during the earthquake in Turkey in 2023. Other conspiracy theories surrounding HARP are more outlandish. In 2016, two men were arrested while on their way to the facility with the intention of destroying it. After being arrested, one of the men claimed that human souls were being used to power it. A recurring conspiracy theory is that HARP uses radio waves to cause mind control. There's a less scientific explanation for this theory, but it suggests that radio waves can in some way alter someone's mind. Our understanding of how electromagnetic waves interact with the brain is always developing. But so far, there's no evidence that radio waves can control minds, or significantly alter them in some nefarious way. Even if that was the case, it's not clear why HARP would cause any more damage than a typical high-frequency radio broadcast. Number 4. For a long time, anti-gravity devices have been a common feature in science fiction. Devices range from simply holding something up in the air to being used to propel objects, vehicles, and people. Anti-gravity devices are possibly also the ones that most people want to go from science fiction to science reality. Every few years, it seems that there's an update on when flying cars or real hoverboards could be a reality. So far, they remain in the realm of fiction. But according to some conspiracy theorists, that might be because the technology has been suppressed. In the mid-1990s, a scientist named Dr. Ning Li published a series of reports on her research. Dr. Lee was a scientist at the University of Alabama Huntsville, who'd been working on the subject of anti-gravity since at least 1989. It was that year that she predicted that a superconducting disk could produce some kind of anti-gravity field. Working with other scientists, she refined her research. Between 1991 and 1993, she co-authored controversial papers where the basic principles of a practical anti-gravity device were laid out. The device would use a high-temperature superconductor to produce what was described as a force field where gravity was counteracted. High-temperature superconductors had only been discovered a few years earlier in the mid-1980s, and were still a fascinating subject to scientists. In simple terms, superconductors have no electrical resistance and expel magnetic fields. This can create an effect where magnetic devices seem to float above the device as they're being repelled by the superconductor. Most superconductors work at a temperature only a few degrees above absolute zero. High temperature superconductors are those that work above 77 degrees Kelvin. It's still incredibly cold, minus 196 degrees Celsius, but it's above the boiling point of nitrogen, which means that liquid nitrogen could be used to cool them. In general, these are superconductors that would be more accessible to scientists in the 1990s. Dr. Lee believed that by running one kilowatt of electricity through a disk of this high-temperature superconductor, a force field of anti-gravity could be created. This would be an area where the force of gravity could be counteracted. It wouldn't simply cause magnetic object to hover an inch above the device. It completely blocked the force of gravity from that point. 
According to her research, a bowling ball could be placed at any point above the device and it would remain there. It created a column of anti-gravity that could extend all the way to space. It sounded like pseudoscience and her papers remained controversial, but a lot of the people she worked with believed in her theories. By 1997, Dr. Lee claimed to have created such a device, which would cause a stir in the media. The fact that nobody seemed to be able to replicate her work was worrying though, but she also had a lot of admirers. An anti-gravity device would have a lot of uses in a variety of sectors, including transportation and the space industry. For example, devices like this, used aboard the International Space Station, could deflect space debris from striking the station. With all the possibilities and controversy from her fellow scientists, it's not surprising that Dr. Lee took her work to a private sector. In 1999, she started a company called AC Gravity to continue her research and find a way to commercialize it. The chair of the university's physics department also joined her at the company. With her work now in the private sector, she stopped publishing as much, but it appears that she was still having some success. In 2001, the company won a grant from the U.S. Department of Defense for over $448,000 to continue the research. It's not clear how exactly an anti-gravity device would be useful for the Department of Defense, but if there was a possibility of another country developing the same technology, which could be weaponized in some way, it would be of interest to the government. After this, Dr. Lee goes mostly quiet, as does AC Gravity. In 2003, she appeared at a conference for research funded by U.S. agencies, where she gave a talk on AC gravity fields. But this seemed to be the last public appearance for the scientist before she disappeared from the public eye. AC gravity continued to have its business license updated until 2018, but it didn't appear to produce anything of note, and what happened to the scientist and the company remained a mystery. The sudden disappearance sparked a lot of conspiracy theories. Technology suppression is a relatively popular conspiracy theory. This is when a piece of technology has been invented but it's kept from the public for whatever reason. Normally, the technology would seriously disrupt existing businesses, so to prevent any economic problems it's kept hidden. An anti-gravity device would definitely disrupt businesses. Even though a device kept at negative 196 degrees seems unrealistic for daily use, Further development of such a device could lead to new discoveries where it would be more attainable. At some point, the research and development could lead to a device that makes our current combustion engines or even electric cars obsolete. On top of this, if the device did have some military purpose, as the Ministry of Defense seemed to believe, keeping it a secret would be extremely important to national security. Making sure foreign countries or even individuals didn't believe this potentially dangerous device was a possibility would be extremely important. In the absence of any evidence, conspiracy theories suggested that Dr. Lee was no longer in the United States. She had been born in China and had immigrated to the U.S. with her family in the 1980s. It was alleged that she had gone back to China and was now working on her research under the orders of the Chinese government. This then prompted more theories that the Chinese government were also working on secret anti-gravity technology. Others believed that her work had simply failed and that she had retired after this was discovered. But that didn't explain why the company had continued to update its business license until 2018 though. The reality is much more simple. A journalist from Huntsville, where Dr. Lee had lived and worked, contacted her son for more information on his mother's supposed disappearance. He wasn't able to talk about Dr. Lee's work, he didn't know anything, and according to him, she hadn't been able to tell anybody about her work. This had caused a change in mood for her. She had liked publishing her research while at the university, but now everything was a trade secret. Dr. Lee's son was able to put the record straight on what happened to his mother after she supposedly disappeared. She'd continued living and working in Huntsville and had continued to work for the Department of Defense. Just because AC Gravity hadn't made any public announcements, that didn't mean that it hadn't been doing any work. In 2014, she'd been walking on the University of Alabama Huntsville campus when she was involved in a car accident that left her with significant medical problems. Not long after this, she began to suffer from Alzheimer's disease and passed away in 2021. Despite the question of what happened to Dr. Ning Li being officially answered, the mystery remains for some people. The outcome of her work remains a secret and may not be revealed for decades to come.
At the end of Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of a Third Kind, a team of 12 specially trained astronauts prepared to board an alien spaceship for an experimental trip to another planet. According to some conspiracy theorists, this part of the movie was based on a real-life government project that ran between 1965 and 1978, called Project Serpo. It started in Roswell in 1947. The story of Roswell is familiar to anyone with even a passing interest in extraterrestrials or UFOs. A flying disc allegedly crashed on a ranch in Roswell, New Mexico. Early on, there were mixed reports about what had actually crashed, but the government announced that it had been a weather balloon, and there was nothing to see. Since then, conspiracy theorists have claimed that the device that crashed into New Mexico was everything from alien technology to a secret military craft. The truth might be somewhere between the official explanation and the secret military craft, as is now believed that the craft was related to Project Mogul, where weather balloon-style devices were used to monitor Soviet nuclear testing. According to the Project Serpo conspiracy theory, the most popular alternative explanation for the Roswell crash was accurate. It was a spacecraft that crashed into the Roswell Ranch. On board was at least one pilot from a planet in the Zeta Reticuli star system, roughly 40 light years away from Earth. These beings had been visiting Earth for at least 2,000 years, and Roswell wasn't the first time their crafts had been noted. These extraterrestrials were one of nine groups that the government had recorded as visiting Earth and were given the designation ETE-2, meaning Extraterrestrial Entity 2. At some point during the project, the acronym ETE became EBE, meaning Extraterrestrial Biological Entity. There were also allegedly extraterrestrials that were mechanical life forms and less friendly, so the separation between the two types was necessary. EBE led to the name given to these aliens, Ebens. They were small beings with brown faces that were sometimes mistaken as greys. In the Roswell crash, at least one of the Eben pilots survived and was held on Earth. Shortly afterwards, the US government was contacted by other Ebens, who were apparently part of a mission to rescue their stranded comrade. The government agreed to return the captured alien in return for technology from the more advanced race. Rather than simply handing over this technology, another idea was put forward. The Ebens would take 12 humans to their home planet as part of an exchange, so they could see for themselves the civilization the Ebens came from. Ten men and two women were chosen for this task. They underwent grueling training while scientists worked with Ebens on the technology that would get humans to the distant planet. The training involves physical and mental tests. The astronauts needed to be prepared for the psychological difficulties of space travel and being isolated in an alien world. In 1961, both the Russians and Americans put men in orbit. According to this conspiracy theory, only four years later, the Americans sent a group of people to another planet. The ship that they would use used antimatter for propulsion. It was capable of traveling at roughly 40 times the speed of light which meant that it only took about 10 months to reach the alien planet. When the travelers arrived, they faced many difficulties, including learning a new way of communicating, as well as the culture of this alien species. The Ebens lived mostly in small village communities and emphasized collective living. One thing the humans wouldn't have been able to get used to was the physical side effects of this new world. The Eben planet had air that was breathable to humans, but there were significant differences to Earth, the planet was smaller and received more radiation. This is possibly due to the effect that the Zeta Reticuli star system is a dual system, meaning that the planet would receive radiation from two stars. The mission was originally set for 10 years, but was extended for a few years. At the end of the mission, two of the astronauts decided to remain on the Ebon planet, while another two had passed away during the trip. The remaining eight returned to Earth in 1978. After being debriefed, they were given new identities and tried to live a normal life. Unfortunately, they continued to deal with the consequences of the exposure to high radiation for the rest of their lives. The initial project was called Project Crystal Knight, but was later named Project Serpo, reflecting the Eben name for their home planet. After the travelers returned home, there didn't seem to have been a repeat of the Project Serpo mission. A report consisting of thousands of pages, including photos and video, was created, then hidden away in archives never to be released. It continued to gather dust until 2005. 
An individual calling themselves anonymous contacted the host of a space-related email list called the UFO Thread List. The list consisted of what the group called insiders, people who had high-level access to government information or had otherwise been involved in official UFO investigations. This wasn't a place for people who simply thought that they saw a flying saucer, or even those who claimed to have been visited by aliens. It was only for those who would have had access to top-secret information. For years, Anonymous leaked top-secret information about Project Serpo. They claimed to be a high-ranking official who was responsible for editing the Red Book, a book that documented the credible UFO sightings and reported information on extraterrestrials to the top of the U.S. government. Other insiders had supposedly heard bits and pieces of the Project Serpo story, and it was deemed credible. Anonymous claimed to be working for the Defense Intelligence Agency and was one of six past and present employees who believed the world needed to know that Project Serpo had taken place. After coming to the conclusion that this was the real deal, members of the UFO thread list decided to create a website and share this information with the rest of the world. A book was also produced to help believers understand what had happened and place it in the context of other supposed extraterrestrial sightings. For most, the entire story is a work of fiction. It was either a hoax created by the government to spread misinformation among UFO enthusiasts, or it was simply a work of fiction created by those who shared it with the general public. For those who believe the conspiracy theory, this really happened. What's more, the world was being prepared for the return of the Ebens with pop culture. There were a number of similarities between what was released and the Steven Spielberg film, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. The Ebens and humans communicated with one another in a sign language, but the Ebens communicated with each other in a more musical language. The 12 astronauts arrived for their meeting with the mothership aboard the bus, and Spielberg even got the gender makeup of the group correct. The movie was released years before the travelers would ever return from Serpo. For most, this is simply a sign that the authors got the details of this story from a work of fiction. But conspiracy theorists believe that Spielberg was hired to share parts of the story with the public, so that they wouldn't be as surprised or scared when the Ebens returned and made their existence known to the general public. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, the Ebens decided not to go through with that and remain a government secret to this day. On December 21st, 2012, the Mayan Long Count Calendar came to an end of its 5,126-year-long cycle. Around the world, people misunderstood what exactly that meant. It wasn't just the end of a complicated dating system, but literally the end of days. Other than this end of the calendar, there was nothing significant due to occur on December 21st, but conspiracy theorists and apocalypse preachers prepared for the end of the world to occur. It didn't. At least, that's what conventional belief suggests. But some conspiracy theorists have pointed out just how strange the world has become over the past decade or so. A lot of events seem to have taken on a bizarre tone and would have been completely unbelievable just a few decades ago. This ranges from politics to pop culture. No part of the modern world seems to be untouched by this strange effect. 2012 wasn't the only year the world was supposed to end. It was also the year that the Large Hadron Collider discovered the Higgs boson. The Large Hadron Collider is a particle collider owned and operated by CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research. There are few real-world organizations that have as many conspiracy theories attached to them as CERN. The organization has made many scientific discoveries concerning particles even smaller than atoms, and is credited with having created the World Wide Web. It may also be responsible for the end of the world. A particle collider uses electromagnetism to accelerate atomic and subatomic particles close to the speed of light. When these particles reach the required speed, they are collided with one another, and the impacts are studied by scientists. Despite the fact that this occurs naturally in the universe, for many, this will lead to a catastrophe and may already have. There were delays before the Large Hadron Collider even opened and some attributed this to a time traveler who was sent back in time to try to stop the end of the world. If this were true, all the travelers managed to do was delay the collider so that the Higgs boson wouldn't be discovered until the year the Mayans predicted the world would end. The Higgs boson is a particle first theorized as existing in 1964. It has no spin, equal parity, and no electrical charge. 
the reason why it was of so much interest to scientists was because this was believed to be the particle responsible for giving mass to other subatomic particles. The problem of how particles gained mass at lower energies was something that scientists had been trying to solve for a while. Without an explanation, our model for how the fundamental building blocks of life worked was incomplete. The Higgs boson and its field were theorized, but for decades it remained unobserved. Finally, on July 4, 2012, scientists at the Large Hadron Collider created a particle that had never been seen before. It was determined to be the Higgs boson, and one of the greatest mysteries in science had been conclusively solved. Overall, this was a good thing for science, as we can now better understand how the world around us works, but some were fearful that this could be the beginning of the end. Even scientist Stephen Hawking warned of the dangers of the Higgs boson, which is sometimes called the God particle. If it experienced very high energy levels, he predicted that this would cause a catastrophic vacuum decay and lead to space-time collapsing. Scientists at CERN continued to run experiments with Higgs boson particles, which presumably could include the high energy levels Hawkins warned of. The theory suggests that this is exactly what happened, and that a catastrophic vacuum decay took place. Alternatively, ever since the Large Hadron Collider was announced, there were theories that this could create miniature black holes. These black holes would be the size of subatomic particles and have the same gravitational pull as these particles. It wouldn't cause any damage to the rest of the world, but conspiracy theorists believe this isn't the case. Observations of black holes show that they act as if they contain some kind of vacuum energy. This could also relate to the predicted vacuum delay related to the Higgs boson. If the world did end in 2012, the question is why we're all still here. This is something of an overarching conspiracy theory that connects many different theories together. One theory concerns alternate dimensions and parallel universes, and involves so-called quantum immortality. A theory of parallel universes is that there are countless universes almost exactly the same as ours, but slightly different. Every instant where multiple things could have occurred produces multiple universes, where those different things did occur. There's a universe where a red light comes on a second later, allowing another car through, and then another where it comes on a second later, and so on. This would also relate to instances where someone passes away. There's an alternate dimension where the things happen slightly differently, and that person continued to live. The theory suggests that our consciousness will always remain in the dimension where we continue living. That would make the consciousness immortal, even if the human bodies weren't. If the theory of quantum immortality is correct, it follows that the end of the world would result in a lot of other people moving to an alternate universe where the world didn't end. The end of the world in 2012 resulted in the world moving to a universe where things are a little more extreme or stranger. The conspiracy theory also goes on to tie into another conspiracy theory, and this time it involves the Mandela Effect. The Mandela Effect is a well-known phenomenon where many people clearly remember something that never happened, or something slightly different. These memories involve everything from famous people to the position of the continents to the spelling of various brands and names. One of the popular explanations for the Mandela Effect is that the people who experience it are from alternate universes, where their memories are actually correct. CERN has often been associated with creating an alternate universe. In this case, it was CERN's experiments with Higgs boson particles in 2012 that resulted in everyone on Earth moving dimensions. A final piece to the puzzle is the question of why some people experience Mandela effects and others don't. If all consciousness were transported from a parallel universe, as well as there being infinite universes where the world didn't end in 2012, there are also infinite universes where it did. All these universes have small changes, such as how the Berenstein Bears name was spelled. So not everybody's consciousness came from the same alternate universe. Of course, a more realistic theory is that the world simply didn't end in 2012. The end of the Mayan long count calendar was no more significant than the end of any other calendar, and the discovery of the Higgs boson didn't result in a vacuum collapse or the Earth being pulled into a black hole. At the end of the Second World War, the United States turned its attention to a part of the world that hadn't received much focus up until that point, the ice-locked continent of Antarctica. In Operation High Jump in the late 1940s, the U.S. Navy explored eastern Antarctica and parts of the Antarctic Peninsula 
for scientific purposes and to look at the potential for future research bases in the area. But according to conspiracy theorists, the leader of that expedition discovered much more than intended when he uncovered an advanced secret civilization beneath the ice. Operation High Jump's leader was Admiral Richard Byrd. Byrd was an accomplished aviator who had explored both the Arctic and Antarctic before. He claimed to have flown over the North Pole, and in 1928, he began his first of five expeditions to the southernmost continent. He was the perfect pick to lead this expansive mission to Antarctica. He would lead Task Force 68, which consisted of 13 ships including an aircraft carrier, many planes and helicopters. Several thousand military personnel, scientists, and support staff were involved. Even though this was only supposed to be a research mission, it was a lot of personnel, especially considering the Second World War had only just ended. But it was important to America to establish its presence in Antarctica, something that a lot of other countries had already done. The mission was to take place between August of 1946 and February of 1947, during the southern summer months. At the end of this period, the team returned to the U.S., where they continued to go over their scientific findings that they'd uncovered, and make plans for later return trips to the southern continent. While an important mission from a scientific perspective, it wasn't too important to the rest of the world, and would have faded into obscurity if it wasn't for the alleged secret diary that was discovered by Admiral Byrd's son. This diary started out as a simple flight log, starting on February 19, 1947. The flight starts out without anything unusual happening. There's only ice and snow to see. Bird then reports mountains, a mammoth, and later green hills and countryside. To his amazement, he then came across a city, which appeared to be made from crystal. There were other aircraft in the sky, which had apparently come from this city. A voice came over the radio. It spoke English, but with a German or Nordic accent, and welcomed him to the new land. Something supernatural seemed to take control of his aircraft and landed. Bird was taken by humanoid creatures to someone they referred to as the Master. The Master informed Bird that he'd been brought here because he was respected on the surface world, and that they had a message he needed to deliver. The subterranean people were concerned about humanity's use of nuclear weapons. They had apparently already spoken to the governments of the surface world to try to get them to stop their research, but they were ignored. They had even sent up flying ships, but these were met with hostility. The Master allegedly wanted Bird to come to this mystical city, so that he could see that people here were much more advanced than the surface dwellers and living in peace. He warned that there would be a new Dark Age, but that humans would survive it and those below ground would help to rebuild it. Exactly what Bird was supposed to do with this message was unclear, as those below ground didn't seem to believe that there was a chance the Dark Ages could be stopped. But he was returned to the other pilots that had come with him, and returned to the surface world. According to the diary, Byrd met with staff at the Pentagon on his return to the U.S. in March of 1947. The government was aware of the underground civilization, but was uninterested in what Byrd or the people there had to say. They dismissed the message, but ordered that Byrd not tell anyone. Byrd made one more entry in the diary in 1956, when he seemed to believe that the dark times had come. But he believes that the truth will come out when the dark times come to an end, even though he's following orders not to speak of it. Diary ends there. When exactly it was discovered by Byrd's son isn't clear. Admiral Byrd passed away in March of 1957, only a few months after his final entry in the diary, if the conspiracy theory is to be believed. His son, also named Richard, is an aviator and naval officer who passed away in 1988, leaving a 30-year time frame for the secret diary to be uncovered. It would only be a few years after Byrd Jr. passed away that books containing scans of the alleged secret diary were published. The actual diary itself has never been revealed or examined. The story of Admiral Byrd is a key piece of evidence in the general Hollow Earth theory. The diary never goes as far as suggesting that the Earth is hollow, only that there's a city and temperate climate beneath the ice in Antarctica. But the people here saw themselves as separate from the surface dwellers, and the story has been incorporated into the Hollow Earth lore. The conspiracy theory has also been connected to UFOs, allegedly seen around military sites and locations where nuclear weapons are housed. It's claimed that these flying objects tried to disrupt the weapons, and have even gone as far as disarming them. There's no evidence that this secret diary actually existed, 
or that there's any secret civilization beneath the ice of Antarctica. Since Operation High Jump, there have been many expeditions to the southern continent, and the land beneath the ice has been mapped out using modern technology. There's no sign of anything man-made or unnatural here, or any openings to an underground network. Another problem with this theory is that theorists seem to disagree whether this happened at the North Pole or the South Pole. Operation High Jump happened at the South Pole, but maps that supposedly lay out the general interior of the Earth show him entering from the North. It's possible Operation High Jump was mixed up with Operation Nanook, which was just a joint US and Canadian military exercise in the Arctic. Despite the inconsistencies, there are many who believe that Bird's secret diary is legitimate, and once the current Dark Ages have passed, the advanced Antarctic civilization will help us rebuild. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.